Thanks, Bob. Appreciate your, your message. And I'm just going to tell you right now, you stole a little bit of my thunder for the sermon. So that's okay. I think the Spirit must want us to know some things. So that's why we reinforce it that way. Um, I do want to apologize up front. I still, <clears throat> I'm still, uh, though I've completely recovered from my COVID experience, I've noticed that my lung capacity still isn't quite back up to snuff. And then after singing, I'm feeling a little bit short-winded. So I apologize um, for that up front. But uh, God is good. He's in this place. And I, am, and I will not be shaken, right? <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and flip over in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, we are um, looking at this passage uh, for the last couple weeks and for the next couple weeks to come because we're talking about spiritual warfare. Uh, I've entitled this sermon series, Battlefront. And we've spent the first two weeks talking about uh, the battle, what the, the, the spiritual battle that is, that is being waged and who the enemy is. Remember from our text, uh, he says that we do not war against flesh and blood, but against uh, spiritual forces and, and the principalities of this earth. And, and, and so our, our battle is a spiritual battle. Now, there may be physical components that take place or that go on, but our battle is, is as Paul indicates, against uh, an enemy that is spiritual, that is the devil. And then, um, and so last week we talked about putting on the, uh, what it means to, to, to put on the armor. Therefore, he says, take up the full armor of God. So that you can resist the devil. We talked about the day of evil and why we fight this spiritual battle. Well, today we're going to begin um, talking about those pieces of armor that Paul mentions in this text. And you're probably familiar with it. If you've, been, if you've uh, listened to the last couple weeks, if you've been here the last couple weeks, I've read this. I'm going to go ahead and read it again just so that it's always in front of us um, from um, beginning in verse 10 of chapter 6. We're just going to look at one verse today, but I want us to make sure we have context. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of, of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist the, the, the evil day. And having done everything to stand, stand firm. And then this is the text that we're going to look at today, verse 14. But I'm going to read it and then the verses after it. He says, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition uh, for all the saints and pray on my behalf that utterances may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly. And so, as I mentioned before, it's, there's a pretty good chance that Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. We, we include this in what we call the prison epistles. And in fact, he mentions there at the end of the text, he, he talks about uh, an ambassador in chains. So it kind of gives us this mental picture that Paul is probably um, locked up. He's probably uh, chained in his cell and maybe dictating this to uh, whoever, or maybe he was allotted a, 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 a quill and, and a parchment, I don't know. But anyway, he is in prison when he writes this letter to the Ephesians. And so not far off, if not chained to him, not far off are probably a, a, a Roman centurion, a guard. And so he has this mental picture in his, in his mind, at least, of a Roman centurion. And I got a picture here I want to show you. Uh, of course, this is not an actual photo from ancient Rome. This is an artist's recreation. Uh, 
today about these first two pieces of equipment that he mentions in verse 14. Let me just remind you again. And I'm reading from the New, uh, or the, the New American Standard. The NIV might read a little bit differently. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But he says in verse 14, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth. Uh, the NIV, I think, might say putting on the belt of truth. It might use the word belt, and that might be something you're maybe a little more familiar with in this idea of girding your loins with truth and having put on this breastplate of righteousness. So we're going to talk about this girding your loins or this belt of truth that Paul mentions and this breastplate of righteousness. So you're kind of getting a two-for-one this morning, right? You're kind of getting two sermons for the price of one. I promise only to take up the time for one sermon. I, I won't preach. Maybe we'll take a lunch break and come back and finish up. I don't know. Anyway, so what exactly does Paul mean when he says, uh, gird, take, gird up your loins with truth. And like I said, in the NIV and some other translations, he does say, put on this belt of truth. But what does he mean, gird your loins? What does that mean? And you may have picked that up in other places in the Bible. It's used actually a couple other places. I love the, the, the use in the, in the book of Job. When God shows up at the end and he speaks to Job and he says, brace yourself like a man. And some translations says, gird yourself up like a man because I'm getting ready to speak. So uh, I found this, uh, this kind of illustration, again, not an original document, an artist's recreation of how to gird up your loins. If you're ever interested in knowing how to gird up your loins. He's got, uh, you had to, to do, you had to fight, or you had to defend yourself, or you're playing tag or something. I don't know what you're doing. And, but if you, had to, if you had to gird up your loins so that you could move around a little better. And I love this illustration there. The guy in the second, in the second frame there, he hikes up his skirt, and then he pulls it to the front, and then he puts it between his legs wraps it around his waist, ties it in a bow, and then he's got his sword. I don't know where his sword came from, where, that, where he was hiding that. But he's got a sword, and he's ready for battle. And so when, when, when someone said, gird up your loins, it was kind of an expression for get ready. Get ready to fight. Get ready for battle. Get ready because something exciting is getting ready to happen. Now, for the Roman soldier, that was a little different. Evan, would you mind going back to that previous picture of the Roman soldiers? So you see there, they're not really wearing a tunic. So for the Roman soldier, when they girded their loins, it was a little bit different. You see, they wore a thick, heavy leather belt. And you can't really see it in that picture. But they wore like a thick, heavy leather belt that would go around just around their, kind of around their hips where we would wear a belt. I think that's where the NIV gets when they say, take on the belt of truth. But it was a very intricate part of the, of the soldier's armor. The, 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 the belt, you see, on the Roman soldier's armor kind of held everything together. It, it made sure that everything um, was in place and, and, and they were ready to fight. One commentator said this, that when the Romans got ready to do battle, one of the ways that signified that they were ready for battle was that they put on this belt. And when the Roman soldiers put on his belt, it was, uh, it was a sign that he was ready for the service and ready to fight. And, he was, uh, and, and this was the way that he girded up his loins. The belt was essential for the, for the soldier because it tightened the rest of his armor to his body so that there was nothing loose or hanging on him. We wear a belt so our pants don't fall down. I guess that's not a bad illustration. You don't want your pants to fall down. But the, the Roman soldier wore that to kind of hold everything together. And Paul says we do that with what? Truth. He says Gird your loins with truth. Put on the belt of truth. Why is that? Because without the truth, everything falls apart. Without the truth, nothing will hold together. Without the truth, 
you're, you're not guarding some of the most vital parts of, your, of, of who you are. And that's what the, 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 the loins are. Some of those vital organs are in that loin area right in here. And so it's got to be guarded with truth, he says. Guard yourself. Put on truth to hold everything else together. Doesn't it make sense that he would start with truth? Uh, one point I do want to make, we're going to take several weeks to talk about these different pieces of equipment. But when Paul is talking about them, he's talking about putting them on all at the same time. That these are things that we wear all together. It's not like, well, today I'll put on truth. And tomorrow, or maybe next week, I'll worry about righteousness. He's talking about the, the armor of God as a whole unit. And so, the, the, but he speaks first about this belt of truth. Of girding up your loins first with truth. So if that's the case, then we have to understand, understand what truth is. Understand what truth is from the Christian perspective. Because you're going to hear people say, well, my truth is this. Or truth is relative. Or that might be true for you, but it's not true for me. And that, that option is not available to us in Christ Jesus. We have one truth truth. And that truth comes from who God is and who we are in Christ Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of Jesus when he was uh, on trial. He was sitting there with Pilate and uh, making these claims about his, uh, his messiahship. And, and uh, he's, the, 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 the question that, that um, Pilate asks, he says, he says to Jesus, are you, are you the king then? All this, all this accusation, all of this going on. Jesus, are you, are you saying that you're the king? And Jesus answered him. He said, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came to this world is to testify to the truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus is making a very powerful claim there about what truth is. And Pilate, kind of like a lot of people, just throws up his arms and says, what is truth? And Jesus has made a claim that he is truth. In fact, uh, if, we, if, we, uh, if we back up to uh, John chapter 14 that, that Bob alluded to a little bit earlier, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the, far, to the Father except through me. And so if we're putting on the armor of God, then it stands to reason that the source of truth is also found in God and in his son, Christ Jesus, who claimed to be God, who claimed to be of God, who said, the Father and I are one. This idea of truth shows up quite a bit in John's gospel. I'm going to uh, also appeal to John chapter 8. When the Jews who had believed uh, him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You see, truth is important. If we're going to put this belt of truth on, we better know what that truth is. And the truth is, is Christ Jesus. The, he is, the, like we said, the way, the, the truth, and the life. So it's not up for debate about what the truth is. The truth is Christ Jesus. The truth is given to us in, in, in God's word. That is truth. So it's not my truth. It's not your truth. It's God's truth that we gird our loins with. It's that truth, that, that belt that holds everything together. Because if we deviate and you have your truth and I have my truth and they have their truth, then what's holding anything together? But, but, but Paul says, put on the, the truth that is in Christ Jesus, the truth that is Christ Jesus. And, and, and I want to point out or, or go back to this idea that this is armor that is used to, to defend ourselves in this battle against a spiritual enemy, the devil. Remember how we described him last week? That prowling lion that, that, that prowls around looking for someone that he could devour, someone that he could destroy. You see, the, the devil is a cunning and conniving enemy. And he lies. 
In fact, Jesus says that, that, that that's his native, when he, when he speaks, he speaks lies because that's his native tongue. That's his native language. And the truth is essential. The truth is necessary. The truth is required because the truth is what repels lies. What are the lies we hear from the enemy, the devil? What are the lies that Satan whispers in your ears? What are the lies that the enemy comes against you with? I, I came up with a list. I, I think we've got them here on the screen. I don't know if this is necessarily an exhaustive list, but I think it's a good start. Have you ever heard these lies? Have these lies ever been spoken to you either by another person or that, that voice of Satan that speaks in our mind? Have you ever heard these lies? You're unlovable. No one could love you. No one could. No one could love you. Certainly not God. Certainly not your spouse. Certainly not your coworker. Certainly not your, you don't have any friends. You're unlovable. What about this? You're unforgivable. That thing you did, nobody can forgive you for that. Certainly not God. That, that is too bad. I mean, there's some bad things out there, but that's really bad. And you're unforgivable. Not only that, but you're worthless. Has anybody ever told you that? Has, has Satan ever whispered that in your ear? You have no value. You're worthless. You're, you're just a, a smudge. You're just pond scum. There's no value in you. And if those things don't work, and you think you've got a pretty good, um, what I want to say, uh, opinion of yourself or, 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 or some self-worth, I think Satan will use that against you too. He's like, you're okay. You're fine. It's okay. You're great. You're doing fine. Right? I'm okay. You're okay. That flies in, in, in the face of what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us, hey, you're not okay. <laughs> right? But I'm okay. I don't, ah, oh, fine. Everything's fine. You ever heard that lie? What about this one? Can anyone really know the truth? I mean, sure, you, you've got the truth, but can we really, really know what the truth is? Isn't that kind of what Satan said to Eve in the garden? Isn't that kind of the, the angle he took with her? Did God really say that you shouldn't eat or touch that fruit? And did he really say that you're going to die if you do? That's, that's a lie that we hear from Satan about we really can't even know what truth is. What about this? Well, God's, you see, God's too busy to worry about dot, 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 fill in the blank. My, your, you know, your problems, your issues, your struggles, your joys, your pains, your concerns. God's too busy for that. He's got a universe to run. He doesn't have time to think about your thing. He's way too busy for that. You ever heard that lie? I got, I got a continuation here uh, on, my, on my list here. So he says, you're too busy, but what about this? Times are changing. The Bible and the church, they're antiques, right? And they're no longer relevant. You ever heard that lie? Has anybody ever said that to you? Have you ever heard that whispered in your ear? What about this? The Bible's too hard to understand. You ever use that as an excuse not to read your scripture? It's too hard. I can't understand it. You know, that's a lie from Satan. That's a, that's a lie to keep you from studying God's word. It's a lie to keep you from, 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 um, from God's truth and, 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 and how it's revealed to us in, in his word. It's too hard. I can't understand it. If, if you're reading your Bible and it's too hard to understand, come and talk to me. Let, me. let me help you learn how to read your Bible. Come to men's Bible study. Come to the little women's Bible study. Learn how to read your Bible for all that it's worth. It's not too hard. You can understand it. You can comprehend it. Don't just believe me because I told you so. Read God's word for yourself. And if if anything, God will get you with this, or Satan will get you with this. You're, you're too busy. You're too busy for this kind of stuff. You've got too much going on. You don't have time for some of these spiritual disciplines. You don't have time to read your Bible. You don't have time to pray. You don't have time to help your friend that's in need. You don't have time for that. You're too busy. What about this? You already went to church once this month, right? 
Why do I need to go again? I already went once. And we make excuses like that. Well, I'll, you know, I read my Bible earlier. I read it yesterday. I don't need to read it today, right? I prayed earlier. I don't need to pray right now. I, you know, we make up these excuses as if there's like a, a bottle that we're just, that, that God waits until it's full. Okay, now you've done it. Now you're okay. No, we don't, we don't fill, we don't have a quota to meet, right? And, and, but but we, we somehow convince ourselves that I've already done that once. I don't need to do it again. I already went to church once this week. It's okay. I'm fine. Okay, and, and, and these last two, I think I'm going to do a sermon series next year on some of these things that sound really biblical, that sound really good, but they're not, right? Just follow your heart. You don't need anything else. Just follow your heart. You know what the Bible says about the human heart? He says, it says that it's wicked above all other things. <laughs> don't follow your heart. Your heart's wicked, Right? I mean, there, okay, there's more to it than that. But it's just, it's kind of like this feel, if it feels good, do it kind of mentality. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. And last and not least, and like I said, this is not a, an inclusive, an all inclusive list, this, this idea that you deserve to be happy. Don't you deserve to be, don't I deserve to be happy? Don't I deserve happiness? Like I said, we're gonna, I think I'm going to do a sermon series on some of these things that sound good, but just don't hold up theologically. <laughs> That's not what the Bible says. Yeah, you, uh, those, those, these, these are all lies that the enemy, Satan, brings to mind, either through other people or through whispering into our ear. But they're, but they're things that if we are wearing the belt of truth, if we have girded our loins with truth, then those lies, when they come, we can identify them. We can see them for what they are. And so he talks first about this belt of truth or girding our loins with truth. And then the next piece of the puzzle, the next piece of the armor that he mentions is this breastplate of righteousness. So go back to my, my picture there uh, of the Roman soldiers. And you see that they're wearing those, those breastplates. And there's two depictions there uh, of, what that, of what a breastplate might look like. But it's that big covering that goes over their chest. What, what was the purpose for this breastplate to a Roman soldier? What was the purpose of that breastplate? Well, it was to cover his most vital organs, wasn't it? Your liver and your lungs and your stomach and your, uh, is a pancreas that important? But it probably covered your pancreas, right? And your spleen. But most importantly, it covered your heart. And that's, that was the purpose of the breastplate to protect you, pr protect your most vital organs, especially your heart. Now, when it comes, speaking metaphorically, speaking spiritually here, when we cover our heart, we're covering the seat of our being. We understand that analogy, right? We understand that word picture of what the heart is. It's the, the seat of our emotions. It's the seat of our desires and our feelings. It's where, it's kind of where our being resides, right? We, we, we talk about our heart in that way. It's not, it's not a, a metaphor that's unfamiliar to us. And so Paul says, put on this breastplate of righteousness to cover your heart. Now, the heart is mentioned over 800 times in the Bible, 600, at least 600 in the Old Testament, at least 200 in the New Testament. And again, that metaphor reminds us of the seat of our emotions, the seat of our being. So we, we, we ought to understand then what righteousness is. If it plays such an important role in this armor of God, what is righteousness? Why do we need it to cover our heart? Well, the Bible defines righteousness as the opposite of wickedness. And sometimes it's, it's a good way to understand what something is is by identifying as what it is not, right? What is the opposite of it? Well, the opposite of righteousness is wickedness. So it is to do, so righteousness has to do with ju doing justly and doing what is right. Okay, does that make sense? If, if righteousness is the opposite of wickedness, it means that we do justly and we do what is right, which is the root word there of righteousness, is it not? 
And this is not our own righteousness. This is not self-righteousness. This is not something that we can create in and of ourselves. No, it comes from who we are in Christ. Remember two weeks ago, we talked about when we fight this spiritual battle, we fight from our place in Christ Jesus. We don't fight with our strength. We fight with his we don't, we don't put on this righteousness of our own. No, we put on the righteousness that comes from Christ Jesus. Because, again, if we, if we put on our own righteousness, if we, if we do what is just or right by our own mind, we're going to have, you have ten people, we're going to have ten different opinions about what's just and what's right. So we have a standard of what is right and just that comes from our position in Christ Jesus. So what is the practical purpose of this breastplate of righteousness when it comes to taking our stand against the devil's schemes? Remember, the devil is crafty. And so I believe that when God, or Paul, well, God spoke to Paul, and Paul gave us this list of, of things to put on, they're very specific we talked about truth. Why do we need truth to repel the devil's lies? Why do we need this breastplate of righteousness? How does that play out in a practical way in our life as a Christian? Well, we need to understand something about who Satan is. We've already talked about the fact that he's a liar, that he's a lion, that he's prowling around seeking, seeking who he can devour. But the devil is also an accuser. That, that's literally what his name means, Satan. He's accuser. He accuses the saints. And, and you see that being played out several times in Scripture, where he accuses the saints of God. Now, with all due respect to my friend uh, Becky, and I don't know if Becky's watching at home, Becky uh, Faroe, who is our, our uh, attorney, our county attorney, right? He kind of plays that role in a courtroom scene as the prosecuting attorney. Unlike Becky, who thinks about justice and who thinks about what is right, the devil doesn't care. He just accuses. He just accuses all day long. That's, his, that's, that's one of his schemes. Is to, is to stand before the throne of God and say, you, you, look what Scott did. You see what he did? Did you see that? He's guilty. He's guilty of this. He's guilty of this. Look what Landon did. I'm going to pick on you, Landon. Look what Landon did. He's guilty of that. Don't laugh, Sharon, because you're next. Sharon, you did this and you did that. And that's what the devil does. He accuses all day long the saints of God. And so we need this breastplate of what is just and what is right to cover our hearts. The devil is an accuser. And the devil will also come to condemn that, 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 that he, he condemns us for the things that we've said, the things that we've done, the, the thoughts that we thought. You know, you are guilty. You, you have done this and you are guilty of it. You stand condemned. That's why we need this breastplate of righteousness. Because the devil reminds us all the time of what we're guilty of. And he reminds us all the time. That we are to be condemned. The wages of sin is death. He, he repeats that line over and over and over and over again. But we need righteousness to remind us that salvation is the gift of God. That it doesn't just end with condemnation. The devil it, it will also puff us up with our pride. We need right, righteousness. We need that which is right and that which is just to prevent us from getting prideful, from, to prevent us from getting puffed up with ourselves and our own accomplishments and how good we are and how okay we are and how, how well we've done this, that, or the other thing. And again, this isn't an exhaustive list, but lastly, the devil will use our own desires against us. He'll use our own desires to bring us down. The thing that we think is good, the thing that we think is noble, the thing that we, that we love the most, he will use those, those things against us. And we need what is right and what is just to guard our hearts so that we're not deceived, so that we're not, we don't um, feel the hard condemnation of the accusations that Satan makes against us or that the world makes against us. 
or that we even sometimes make against ourselves. We need righteousness to protect our heart, to protect our, our being, that which is just, that which is right, by God's standard, by, by who Christ is and what he's done. Remember, we come at this not from our own strength, but from our position in Christ Jesus. And so, church, as we look forward into the next couple of weeks about talk, and talk about some of these other pieces of equipment, just for maybe for today and for the, and for the, the, the rest of, well, the rest of the day, but the week, the week that is to come, maybe really pay attention and think about what it means to put on this belt of truth. And what does it mean to really put on this breastplate of righteousness? Now, remember, like I said, we put these all on at the same time. These are things that we, that we are called to wear at all times. But I hope that truth and righteousness this week and the weeks to come can pave the way as you, as you come against Satan and uh, put on your armor to fight against his schemes, to fight against his plans, to bring you down when what God wants to do is guard your heart. And what he wants you to do is be victorious in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. We want to give you an opportunity to respond this morning. And I know we're doing things. Go ahead and come on up, praise band. Uh, I know we're doing things a little bit differently. Sometimes we, what we've done in the past is given you an opportunity and invited you to come forward. And it's a little different now because my responsibilities are different and we don't have uh, some of the personnel in place. And that's okay. It's just, it's just the way we're doing things now for a time. But I know that God is working in your heart. And I know that God is working in your mind. And if he has brought anything to your attention, is he, if he's brought conviction about anything, please come af after service. Come and talk to me. <laughs> Uh, and if you don't want to talk publicly, we can find a private place to talk or you can call me. But if there is something that is going on in your life, maybe for the very first time you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do that. We can talk. We can begin that conversation. We can start talking about baptism and what it means to cover ourselves with Christ, uh, to be buried with him in, in, in baptism, what it means to follow hard after him, what it means to be a disciple. And maybe you just need somebody to pray with you. And if that's the case, then, then please seek me out. Come and talk to me. There's other people here I know. We've got uh, some of our deacons here, Evan and Bob. Um, our elders aren't here today because of some of the COVID stuff that's going on. But uh, there are other people here I know that would love to pray with you and uh, do whatever they can do to, to meet, um, meet, meet your needs in Christ Jesus. So